Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, church, uh, I've shared with you the five strategic emphasis for New, Hor New Horizon Church over the next three to five years. I've also shared uh, the team for 2024, which is rooted and built up in Christ, okay, which is a wall mural here. Okay? But to have the motivation to grow in Christ or to participate in the transformation of NHC, we first need to align our personal goals to God's purposes because some of us may not feel motivated as yet to, uh, you know, to be on this journey. So today, the message that I will share will be to help us align our motivations. Okay? So there are three important questions in life that we all need to ask ourselves. Number one, what are your goals in life? What do you shoot for? Okay? Number two, what happens at the end of our earthly journey? Okay, we need to talk about eternity. And number three, is there a higher purpose in life? Not just to live for this life, but to live for eternity. So these are three very important uh, questions which we will address today. Now, a Bible school friend of mine, a young man, maybe in his 30s, he shared that as a teenager, he went into depression, just thinking about the fact that he would one day grow old and die. Okay, he felt that life was meaningless because... Everything that he holds dear and everything that he has worked so hard for will all disappear one day. So because of that, he felt there was no purpose to life and he fell into depression. But that set him on a journey of faith, a journey of uh, seeking, and he ultimately found his uh, higher purpose in Christ. But not everyone has found that answer though. Last year, uh, Sister Florence and I, we visited uh, Prague. We took a day trip to visit a church called the Ozuari. It's a popular tourist destination with elaborate decorations using human skeletal remains from the 16th century. Has anyone been to this church? Skulls and skeletons everywhere, you know, the decorations is an is a RC church, all right? Uh, a tour guide was talking to an elderly couple okay, in the church and he said, as you look at these skulls and these bones, imagine them saying to you, what you are now, I was, and what I am now, you will be. <laughs> that woman was triggered and she became upset. You know, she scolded the tour guide and her husband had to calm her down, telling her, he's just helping us to reflect about life. But perhaps she was wrestling with unanswered questions. What happens when we die? And she was fearful because she did not have the answer. So that's why today I will talk about these three questions that will determine how we live our lives. Okay, therefore, the title of my message today is Living the Abundant Life with an Eternal Perspective. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today on a very uh, important topic. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you come and anoint my lips, anoint my mind to speak with clarity as we consider, uh, you know, things uh, of eternity, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you will also uh, open the hearts and the minds of every hearer in this congregation. That let your word go forth to speak to them, to assure them, to edify them, to challenge them, uh, and to align them, Lord, to your goals, Lord, so that we can, uh, you know, walk out from this session having our goals in life aligned to your eternal purposes, Lord. So we commit everyone into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so what are your goals in life today? We're often influenced by the measures of success set by our society. In Singapore, we have the Singapore dream, right? Many pursue the material things, which include the five Cs. What are the five Cs? Condo, cash, car, club, and credit card. Okay. So it's really about climbing the corporate ladder, keeping up with the Jonases, uh, you know, uh, hoarding up more possessions. Okay. But the Christian measure of success should be different from the world. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our minds are to be renewed by the Word of God. So what does God's Word have to say about this? Now, Jesus told this parable in Luke chapter 12, 
Luke chapter 12, verses 15 to 21. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. It may be a, a little small. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the Bible tells us that when we hoard up riches, at the end, somebody else will enjoy it. Right, this, this morning I read the news that uh, you know, one of our famous Singaporeans uh, had just passed away at 95. You know. He's, he left behind a lot, right? Uh, you know, but somebody else enjoys it in that sense, all right? So the Bible tells us that we are to be rich towards God. That means to have spiritual wealth and spiritual capital. Instead of pursuing material possessions, we need to pursue spiritual wealth to be rich towards God. And the problem with material possessions is that they are temporal. Everything will be gone at the end of our earthly journey. We cannot carry anything to eternity. Unfortunately, people tend to still store up riches on earth instead of heaven. They are concerned with how much they have in their earthly bank accounts instead of how much they have in their heavenly bank accounts. They are concerned with their earthly pursuits instead of living for eternity. However, our life on earth is on a least whole. In Singapore, the life expectancy on average is about 83. Well, as we have mentioned, the women live longer than men. Uh, don't ask me why. <laughs> I'll tell you because uh, the women stress the men, right? But, but recently, I found another uh, answer to it. I was watching TikTok. I know some guys, uh, they did a video. They were hanging dangerously, doing some silly stunts. And the caption there said, that's why women live longer than men. Because men do silly things. I don't know. Maybe that's true. <laughs> okay, so I didn't think much about, you know, life and death, uh, about death, actually, uh, in my teens, in my youth, right? I don't think our youth will be thinking that far ahead. Or even when I was 30, right, as a young adult, I didn't think much of it. But when I got to my 40s, I started taking stock of my life. Whenever I attend a funeral, I will ask myself, am I living every day with an eternal perspective? Am I living my life, uh, you know, building something uh, of eternal value or just storing up riches on earth? So these are very important questions that we need to ask ourselves, right? And uh, for some reason in this season, yeah, there, there has been uh, quite a number of uh, funerals as well. So every time we attend a funeral, please ask ourselves these important questions. Am I living every day with an eternal perspective? Am I investing into eternity or just living for now? Okay. And in, there's another very important passage in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21, where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, meaning that they are temporal. And where thieves break in and steal, they are not secure. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. So these are eternal treasures which are secure. And then it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay? So this passage tells us that earthly treasures are temporal. They are not secure. They will be gone one day. Therefore, Jesus says uh, we should not be storing up treasures on earth. But instead, we should be storing up treasures in heaven, which last for eternity, which are secure. 
And interestingly, verse 21 tells us, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sometimes we think, where my heart is, the treasure will follow, right? We think that way, right? But it actually says the opposite. Where your treasure is, your heart will also be. Okay? So as a result, it is very important that we make that choice, that decision to invest into the kingdom of God because when you invest your time and energy in the kingdom of God, your heart will also be in the kingdom of God. It is important that we give tithes okay, for the work of the kingdom because when we do that, then your heart will also be with the church. Okay? Therefore, investing time for God, serving God and tithing are all important uh, things that we do to help set our heart at the right place. And the purpose, uh, the pursuit of material possession, the other problem is that it is also very narrow in scope. All the five C's focus on physical needs at best. Okay? But we have higher needs than this. Okay? And our needs cover the dimensions of spirit, soul, and body. But what we don't realize is that many people pursue material possessions at the expense of other aspects of our lives. Consequently, they may have a lot of other problems, spiritual oppression, marriage issues, family issues, friendship issues, fears, anxieties, physical health issues, financial issues, investments, etc. Okay, we, we always think that the richest people are the happiest people. Actually, it's not true. Is that your observation too? Okay, I was just reading about the, the richest woman in Australia, Gina Reinhardt. Right, who inherited all the wealth from the husband. You know, her family, right? They, they, the children uh, sued her, uh, brought her to court. You know, there's all this infighting over the family trust. And they're no longer in relationship. They're no longer on, even on talking terms. You know, why? You know, it's so sad, yeah, to have so much money and yet, you know, relationships are all destroyed, okay? So, as a, a pastor, I also I see the full range of issues, uh, challenges faced by people, but I also know through the Word of God that God wants us to prosper in our spirit, soul, and bodies. Okay, so the prosperity of God, the abundant life of God is all-encompassing. Okay, it covers, most importantly, the spiritual, then the soul, and then the physical, all right? In the world, is the other way, right? It's always a physical first, right? So in the spirit dimension, we can experience life through being born again in Christ. We can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to be filled and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can experience the leading of the Spirit in our hearts as He bears witness with us that we are children of God. And we can bring, we can share this life that we have experienced with others through sharing the good news of Christ. And in our souls, the life of God flows from our, within our spirit man into our souls. And the Bible tells us that we can experience the mind of Christ to be instructed by the Spirit. We can experience emotional healing and wholeness when we are filled with love, joy, and the peace of God. Right? The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but it's about joy and peace right? in the Holy Spirit and righteousness. So, you know, when, when we are you know, in the kingdom of God. These are the new emotions that we experience, right? Love, joy, peace are the first three fruit of the Spirit. As we are filled with all this, it brings about, you know, emotional wholeness and health and fortitude, okay? And 3 John 2, the Apostle John prays, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. We can prosper in our soul. And that is something that money cannot buy. John prays also that we will be in health as our soul prospers. So you can see that you know, everything is linked, right? It starts from the spirit to the soul to the body. When your soul prospers, your health prospers too. And as Pentecostals, we believe in divine healing. And we know that the life of God can also touch our physical bodies too. Romans 8.11 says, but if the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. 
So we believe the life of God can even touch our physical bodies. Okay? And we have you know, heard so many testimonies of healing even in, in uh, New Horizon Church. Right? So we know that God is good. So don't get me wrong. You know, we do live in a fallen world and in a fallen world there will be problems. We're not saying there will be no problems. But the difference is this. When we are faced with a problem, we have someone to turn to. If you do not have Christ, who do you turn to? But we have Christ, we turn to Him. And in Christ, we have redemptive promises because of what He has done at the cross. So therefore, as Christians, we are with hope. Okay, we have Christ to turn to. Okay, therefore, true abundant life is not found in material possessions of this temporal world. Instead, it is found in our spiritual relationship with God, you know, through His redemptive power manifested across every aspect of our lives as we store up riches in heaven. So, but how can we experience this abundant life across all the dimensions of our life? We live in a fallen world mired in sin, and sin results in condemnation, curses, and death. This is evident when we read the papers we see the effects of death everywhere, right? Through sin, the devil seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And sin is like a quicksand. A man who is trapped in quicksand cannot save himself. He needs someone who is not in the quicksand to throw him a rope to pull him out. So therefore, only someone who is not in sin can save this world that is in sin. And the Bible tells us that for God so loved the world, He gave us His only Son, Jesus, to come from heaven, to save us from our sins because He is without sin. So therefore, Jesus is our solution to sin. He is our source of life. Okay, John 10 verse 10 says, Jesus declares, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. So this is the promise of Jesus to us. This is the declaration of Jesus to us, the proposition. He has come that we may have life and life more abundantly. And this life can only come through Him, through Jesus alone. Okay. So when we receive Christ, the first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. So Christ lives in us through His Spirit. Okay. So He imparts life to us, within us, through His Spirit. Because John 6, 63 uh, says, if the Spirit, uh, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are Spirit and they are life. Okay? So we can experience this life of Christ in us through His Spirit and through His words. The Word of God is Spirit and is life. That's why as Christians, we want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to meditate on the Word of God because Uh, we experience the life of Christ through this, right? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ and Jesus is the living Word, right? In John chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, so through the Word and the Spirit, we experience Christ. And the Bible says that he who has a son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So through His Word and His Spirit, we experience His life, okay? So the abundant life of Christ starts in our spirit, man. It touches our souls and our bodies if we surrender every part of our lives to Him. So this is the big challenge for us. Because as Christians, some of us may not have surrendered every part of our lives to Him. Right? There are parts of our lives where we hold back to ourselves. Have we surrendered, let's say, our marriage to Him? Have we surrendered our children to, to Him? Or are we holding tight to them? Have we surrendered our careers, our jobs? Have we surrendered... You know, every aspect of our lives to Him. Who do we turn to when we have a problem? Do we turn to God first? Do we turn to the doctor? Do we turn to someone else? Right? So we need to surrender our lives, spirit, soul, and body to the Lord so that He can work and effect His life in that part of our body. Okay? In that part of our lives. Okay. Therefore, only through Jesus we can experience Uh, true and abundant life. That is why it is so critical for us to be rooted and built up in Christ, which is our theme for the year. So I'm connecting that. Why should we be motivated to be rooted and built up in Christ? Because it is only through Christ we can experience His abundant life. Okay. Some Some people may think that it is a burdensome endeavor 
to grow spiritually, to attend church or connect groups, and we don't feel motivated. Okay? Anyone feels this way? I'm sure none, right? Okay. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. That is the devil's deception because he knows that when you are rooted and built up in Christ, you will experience abundant life and he doesn't want you to experience abundant life. He has come to steal, kill and destroy. Okay? So Jesus did say, uh, you know, John 15, 15, he says, I'm the wine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So today, if we want to experience the abundance of Christ, we need to come to Jesus, be plucked into Him, abide in Him and Him in us, right? To be rooted and built up in Christ. And that is the key to abundant life, okay? In fact, it is dangerous to not grow spiritually. It's dangerous. Why? Because when you're not connected to Jesus, the source of life, you are missing out on His abundant life. Okay? So I pray that with this knowledge, all of us are excited about our team for the year to be rooted and built up in Christ. Amen? How many of us are excited? So few. Uh. Okay, how many of us are not excited? Okay, everyone's excited. Thank you. Okay, next I want to talk about what happens at the end of our earthly journey. Now, the abundant life of Christ starts from the moment we receive Him and it continues into eternity. The abundant life of Jesus includes eternal life, which is to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. Right? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 11.25, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That is the hope, that is the promise that all of us have as believers in Christ. So today, for those who, of us who have Christ in our hearts, we do not fear physical death. Okay? Fear only happens when there is uncertainty of what happens after we die. Okay? But because we have the, this knowledge through the Word of God, we have that certainty through the Word, we are not afraid anymore. Okay? Because we know that right at the end of this life's journey, when we cross that bridge, we will meet Jesus on the other side. He will be receiving us. Therefore, we do not fear death. Okay? And how do we know that Jesus is there to receive us? Because Jesus rose from the dead and He has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. He told His disciples that in John 14. And as a proof that He has reached heaven, He says, when I, when I reach heaven, I will pour out the Holy Spirit. And He has done that on the day of Pentecost. So therefore, the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost is the proof and the evidence that Jesus is seated on the throne in heaven. Okay? So therefore, we know that one day, you know, when we enter into that realm, we will meet Him face to face. There are some very amazing testimonies of people who have died and later came back to life. And then they shared what happened, right? They, they saw heaven or they saw hell. Um, there is this testimony of a Nigerian pastor who died for four days. He, he received a death certificate from the doctor. He was sent to a morgue where they started to embalm him. Okay? And uh, they even, uh, in this documentary, they even interviewed the doctor and the, the staff at the mortuary. So it's a real story. It's not a made-up story. Okay? But his wife was a godly woman who prayed that he would come back to life because of certain promises that God had given her earlier. So she brought his corpse in a coffin to a Reinhard Bonke meeting in Nigeria. And then they brought this coffin to a basement room, took out his, his uh, corpse and put it on a table. And then they, they prayed and they worshipped, you know. And the anointing was so strong that when they prayed for him, he started breathing again. But his body was still stiff like rock. So they started to massage his body. And the blood started to flow. Uh, it began to uh, be warm. And then he came back to life. And he shared how he had seen heaven and hell. And, but Jesus told him that he must come back uh, to bring a message to the people that heaven and hell is real. Okay? So I believe heaven and hell is real because God's word says so. But this testimony is interesting because it confirms what the word of God says. Okay? 
And therefore, because eternity is real, we should live life with an eternal purpose. We should have a higher purpose in life. Amen? So, how do we live life with a higher purpose today? Well, God has a plan for our lives. He has a higher purpose for us, which has eternal consequences. And we've all been given a race to run, called the race of faith. And Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, the author of Hebrew says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. This is a very powerful passage. It refers to the great cloud of witnesses in the earlier passage. Okay? And this great cloud of witnesses are the Old Testament saints who walked in faith and who played important roles in the redemptive history of the Bible. Okay, they paved the way for the coming of Christ. For example, Abraham walked in faith and through his seed, you know, Christ came. Okay? You talked about David, right, who, uh, you know, who, who was the king of Israel and through his seed, right, Jesus would be the next uh, Davidic king. All right? And when we look at all these Old Testament saints, we should be inspired by them through their life of faith. And then it comes to, well, what about us? What role do we have to play? Right? And that's why this passage says that, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So now we take the baton, and we have a race to run. We have to carry that, that story in redemptive history. Right, Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He did everything He could. He paid the price on the cross. He became an atonement for the sins of all of mankind. He became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What good is that if nobody gets to hear that message? You have the best, you know, imagine you have the best restaurant in Singapore, but nobody knows about it. What good is it? Right? You have the best gospel, the best good news. What good is it if nobody knows about it? That's why Jesus commissioned his disciples, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. And he says, I will send my spirit when the spirit has come upon you. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is foremost on the mind of Jesus, the commission that he gave to his church, his disciples. And today it is the same for us. We have a role to play in bringing the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. And then He will return, okay, as He had said in Matthew 24. Okay. So as a church, we are to deliver people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We are to establish the kingdom of God where Jesus reigns as a king of kings. Okay. And that is the great commission of Jesus for His church. But as individuals, okay, we all have a small part to play. We have diverse roles to play in supporting that overarching purpose of the church. Okay? So God has given each of us a calling. He has given us talents to serve in specific ministries of the church. So for example, as a church, we want to evangelize the lost. We're going to run an alpha program, but it's going to take many people to be involved to make that program work. Right? You could be doing... Uh, uh, be a facilitator, you could help do the planning, you can book the hotel, you can book the, the food and catering. There's so many roles that we can all play together to meet the overarching goal of reaching the lost, which is through the church. Okay? So that is our spiritual race, that role that we must play and we must complete. Okay? So we are to run our race with our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Okay. And I'm not dichotomizing the, uh, between the sacred and the secular, okay? the spiritual uh, in, and the non-spiritual. Okay? Running our race of faith does include secular activities. God has given us, some of us, power to get wealth to finance His kingdom work. He has given us, some of us, talents in the marketplace to be a positive spiritual influence 
in positions of leadership. It is about engaging in both spiritual and secular realms for the higher purpose of Christ. So all of us can play that role, even in the marketplace, all right? And next, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay, all these things were the things that uh, the, the, the physical earthly needs of the people. Okay, when you put God's kingdom first, God promises, okay, all these things, your earthly needs, right, it will be met. Okay, so therefore, from this passage, it says we are to seek first the kingdom of God to be faithful stewards of the gifts and talents He has given us to build His church, okay? And when we do that, He will take care of us, okay? And again, seeking first the kingdom of God does not mean to neglect our secular work. It means doing your secular work with a higher purpose for the kingdom of God. If you're a student, it means to study well as a testimony for Christ. Okay, when you when you work uh, in a workplace, it, it means to to work with uh, you know to be responsible, to do your best, uh, to have the right ethics, so that you're a testimony for Christ. Okay, but whether we work or we study, when we do it for the glory of God, something happens. God puts His anointing upon you, and His blessings upon you. Okay, so that is very important. In the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel he did well both as a student and as the prime minister of the Babylonian and Persian empires. He was influential and he played a role in the redemptive purposes of God. Okay, so he is a very good example of how we should live our lives okay, for Christ. So I just want to share a brief testimony. At the age of 20, I was a backslidden Christian without a purpose in life. Then I encountered God in a revival and I found my purpose in life through God. And God called me into the ministry. I wanted to quit uh, university to go to Bible school, but God showed in a vision very clearly that I had to first complete my studies, go through the corporate world before going full-time. As I progressed in my career, uh, one of the groups that I was ministering to, it grew into a church in uh, 2013. So as I journey in life uh, between ministry and uh, in the corporate world, one thing is that the vision that the Lord gave me at age 20, it never left me. So I was constantly praying and asking God when I should quit and move to the next phase of the vision. And then the Lord said to me one day, He answered my prayer, He said, before you turn 50. Okay, that was loud and clear. And then it happened just as the Lord had said, right? At 49, uh, I quitted, okay? So I took stock of my life regularly because I held on to God's calling and the vision that He had given me at the age 20. I wanted to run my race of faith and to finish it. Throughout the journey, I've experienced great joy and fulfillment in living life with God's higher purpose. And this is something that the world cannot offer. We experience the fulfillment of obeying God, okay, a personal fulfillment within us. And the other fulfillment is to see people uh, respond to God, to see people blessed by the ministry. Okay? So it is a great joy. So likewise, I pray that all of us here, we will take stock of our lives and be intentional to live the abundant life of Christ with an eternal purpose, fulfilling our calling and running our race. So therefore, in summary, the three points. First, we should pursue abundant life by being rooted and built up in Christ. Okay, there's no other way, there's no other source of life, all right? It is only through Christ. And therefore, we should be rooted and built up in Christ. And that is our theme for the year, all right? Number two, we know that earthly life is temporal. Therefore, we should live for eternity. And number three, we should live life purposefully and fulfill the calling of God because we're going to meet Jesus one day to give an account to Him for how we have lived our lives. Okay? And in fact, Jesus is coming back soon. Okay? We know that, right? As we look around the world, 
what's happening, we know. We know He's coming back soon. So today, at New Horizon Church, you can live life with an eternal purpose. We provide you with the platform to fulfill your calling by serving the church community, by sharing the gospel, by discipling others once you have been discipled, by raising up the next generation, by serving in various ministries. You can play a role to support the five strategic trusts of New Horizon Church within the next three to five years. Now, as a Christian, in my teenage years, I was backslidden. I wish I had this opportunity that you have today. I was not equipped to serve. I was not equipped to share the gospel. I was not discipled. I went through uh, the school of hard knocks. I learned through trial and error. I learned through, uh, you know, reading books in bookshops, which I didn't have money to buy in those days. And I was thrown into the deep end. I had to learn how to swim or sink. Okay, but today at New Horizon Church, not only do we offer you the platform, but also the opportunities, also the training, also the guidance to help you fulfill your calling. So therefore, I pray that you will embrace it wholeheartedly. All right? 